I'm Robert Lewis, your Explore presenter. If you're a spiritual seeker interested in knowing more about the Bible, Jesus, and the Christian life, or if you're a friend needing a video resource to use with spiritual seekers you know to discuss Christian basics with, then Explore is for you. Explore provides thought-provoking insights to understanding both the Old and New Testaments that most Christians rarely get. It offers solid evidence to the Bible's supernatural claim of being inspired by God, and it introduces and details the unique life of Jesus and his life-changing claims of eternal life to anyone who believes in him. Finally, it offers a helpful way of understanding how the Christian life is practically lived out, not as a religion, but as a lifestyle. And with each Explore video on YouTube, you will find a link to helpful notes for that session you can easily download. So enjoy Explore. And if we can assist you in any way, contact us at adventures.life. All right, good morning, guys. Good morning. I hope you're doing well today. And uh, we're about to take an adventure in a series called Explore Confidence Building. So I want you to remember that Explore Confidence Building, where over the next six weeks, uh, we're going to explore some of the essentials and basics of the Christian faith. And so I'm just delighted that uh, you would take the time to join us this early in the morning, <laughs> especially this early in the morning. And so our goal is real simple. Our goal is to explore the basics of Christianity. And uh, while doing that, hopefully we get a chance to give you some confidence, which I think a lot of people, believer and unbeliever, don't have in this all-time best-selling book called The Bible. So I want to give you confidence in the Bible where it doesn't feel like some strange alien book, you know, that sometimes sits on a coffee table and doesn't go anywhere else, where you look at it and you see it as something you can engage and feel confident in. And also, as we go through the Bible, uh, discover in an articulate way some key spiritual truths that you always hear out. They're kind of floating out there, but you, you may ask yourself, what does that really mean? And we want to unwrap that for you in a real relaxed environment. There's going to be no pressure here. All the pressure's on me just to deliver. <laughs> and I'm going to try to do as best I can. But that's why we're here. We're here to build your confidence in these basics and make you feel comfortable with the Bible. And let me tell you, I've done this now for probably over 30 years. And uh, I've done a lot of different things, but, but I've got to tell you guys, for me, getting up this morning is a privilege. And I'm just delighted to be here because I can't think of anything I'd rather do than sit down with a group of men and just talk about basics of the Christian faith. You know, this year, um, when the football season ends, and I'm a big kind of football guy, I love uh, uh, being involved in watching football teams and stuff, although it's kind of hurting uh, this year. But, uh, you know, this year at the end of the season, we'll have Super Bowl 52. Super Bowl 52. And believe it or not, I can remember as a teenager watching Super Bowl I, okay, between the Green Bay Packers and the Kansas City Chiefs. And the Green Bay won. Uh, the coach of the Green Bay that year was Vince Lombardi. And uh, because probably he won the first Super Bowl now, when you see at Super Bowl 52, they give the trophy to the winning team. It's called the Vince Lombardi Trophy because he won the very first one. Lombardi was legendary as a coach who, who relentlessly stressed basics. Uh, he had teams that did innovative things, but he believed more than probably anybody that until you master the basics, it's really difficult to go on and do anything else well. And so after he won the Super Bowl, uh, in summer camp the following year, he called the Packers in. They were all sitting out there, and he said, Guys, I think, just looking at you guys, we're going to have to go back to basics again. And he said, uh, we're going to have to stress those because they're the key. Those fundamentals are key to a winning team. And then he reached down, and he said, Gentlemen, this is a football. <laughs> and they... They, uh, here go John. John was my roommate at Arkansas. Uh, then they started with basics again. And by the way, went on and won the Super Bowl again. Now, why do I tell you that? I tell you that because 
when it comes to the spiritual world, when it comes to Christianity and spiritual life, it is so important to master the basics. Most people, when they go to church, get elevated past the basics into good messages from the pulpit and programs and stuff like that. But if you don't have a good foundation, it's very difficult for you personally to go on from there in a really healthy way. And so this morning, uh, here's what I want to say to you. Gentlemen, this is a Bible. And what we're going to do this week and next week, two out of our six weeks, is that we're going to just open up the Bible and break it down and how it's laid out, what kind of um, structure it has in a way that you can look at this book and go, I got it. I, I'm, I may not know everything in here, of course, you'll spend the rest of your life in that regard, but this book won't look like some big book that scares you to death, which it does most people. And when a lot of people go to church and they are told to open up to Malachi, they have no, no clue where Malachi even is, much less what it contains. And then when they're told, you know, to get to Zephaniah, you know, or to Jude, they may get there and start reading, and they, when they start reading, they go, what is this about? And you know why they don't know that? Because they don't know the basics. <laughs> they don't know that this book is not that difficult, and you can understand it. So what I'm going to do this morning is we're going to start with the first half of the Bible, the Old Testament, and I'm going to give you an Old Testament layout. Next week, we'll do a New Testament layout. But in doing that, what I hope to accomplish is to give you kind of a map and an easy read map that will allow you to feel comfortable with this book. Okay, everybody good for that? You good to go in that? Now what we're going to do is we're going to break it down in nine principles and walk through those nine principles and then at the end what I'm hoping you'll do is between this week and next week you'll take at least just one hour, just one hour to take your notes and just look back through them and just kind of rehearse what you heard and if you have difficulty, we'll send you a YouTube video of this session, and you can watch it again. But my goal for you is just to say, you know, it makes sense to me. I, 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 I've got a journey ahead to discover all the rich truths that are in there, but this makes sense to me. And if, you, if I get you to that place, guys, here's what I want you to know. You'll be further ahead, trust me on this, further ahead than 95% of all people who go to church just because you know the structure, the layout. The Bible makes sense. So we've got nine principles. Now here's where we're going to start in this basic um, overview. I just want you to turn in your Bible to the table of contents. Just turn to the table of contents where it'll list all the books of the Old Testament and the New Testament. If for one reason or another you didn't bring a Bible this morning, that's okay. Just ask the guy next to you, can I look at your table of contents with you? So let's do that for a second. And everybody get there where they see the books of the Bible laid out. And we're just going to stay there for the session. And if you're not opposed to this, I might actually ask you to write in that table of contents, block some things off so you can have it uh, clearer for you after you leave here today. So here's what we're going to do. Using your notes, using that table of contents. Everybody there? Everybody there? Using that. Let's begin by uh, looking at the first principle. Here's what it says. The Bible contains 66 individual books written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different authors addressing a multitude of various subjects and controversial topics. But here's the big but. But with miraculous unity. Miraculous unity. Now let me let you just feel that. We could spend the whole hour here, but let me just let you feel that for a moment. We're talking about a book, this book. It's not a book by one author. Now I hope to convince you there is one big author behind it, but it was written by 40 different human authors. Okay, These guys did not know each other. Many of them were separated by a thousand years. They came from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different cultures. Some were poor, some were rich. Some were powerful, some were weak. <laughs> some, some were in cultures that, that oppressed them. Some were in cultures in which they had a prominent role. 
there were a multitude of different guys separated by vast periods of time writing their own individual books, 66 of them over that period of time. But in some miraculous way, when they finally came together, this book fit tighter together than any book that's ever been written. And let me tell you, anybody who ever spends a long period of time in the Bible, like I have, sometimes just sits there and has to shut it and go, this is amazing that it's this tight, that it's this together in what it said. I mean, you can be studying a subject of marriage and you can go back and look what Moses said on marriage in the book of Genesis in 1500 B.C. And then you can read what one of Jesus' followers said about marriage, the Apostle Paul, in 40 A.D. Now we're talking about 1540 years. And not only do those two match in what they're saying, one adds a little color to the other, but what you get out of both of those things is a miraculous teaching on marriage that's unified. Not too long ago, I wrote a book with another pastor who lives in Hawaii. He is, he's got uh, Polynesian ancestry. He lives in Hawaii. I live in Arkansas. We were going to write a book on church leadership. We labored over that book for two years, coming at leadership from our different perspectives, our different backgrounds and stuff like that. We wrote it, rewrote it, wrote it, rewrote it, and then it finally came out, and it was a big dud. And part of the reason why is because even now when I pick it up and read through it, you can feel the change of authorship through it. You can see the different perspectives that kind of, well, they kind of match and they kind of don't. Because it's difficult to write a book with another person. Well, we're talking about a book that was written by 40 different people over 1,500 years in all these different locales, and yet you don't feel, you can feel a little bit of the texture of what they're saying in their historical context, but you don't feel this big disruption. What you feel, in fact, is a tremendous unity. So I want to start by saying, this is an amazing book. You will never find another book on planet Earth that can match this for unity. And what makes it miraculously is how it came together over that, that distance of 1,500 years with guys who had no idea who the other guy was. Now, what you will tend to lean to to conclude, as I said, is, well, the reason they had that kind of unity is there was a supernatural author behind all of them. And I'm not saying you have to believe that, but that's what it almost lends you to believe because of that unity. So that's principle number one. Principle number two is this. The 66 books of the Bible that you see in front of you are divided into two testaments. Now, you know, I, I went for years calling it the Old Testament and New Testament, and finally one of my kids, this is years later, said, what's a testament? And I went, um, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I didn't know. I had to go look it up. You know, but we use it all the time, don't we? Well, here's the answer. Testament was derived from the Latin word testamentum, a word used in early Roman times to refer to a covenant. Testament and covenant mean pretty much the same thing, or agreement. It's an agreement between God and man and how they would relate to one another. So in the Old Testament, or the Old Agreement, there is a way that man would relate to God as you read through those Old Testament books. And primarily what you find is the Old Testament written to the Jewish people. They were to relate to God mostly through God's law, okay, God's law that He gave to Moses, and through His chosen leaders. There were a number of chosen leaders you get introduced to as you read through the Old Testament. You get introduced to Abraham, then Moses, then David, then Solomon, uh, then Joshua or uh, Jeremiah or whatever. You get introduced to these leaders and the people would respect these godly leaders and they had a law given through Moses and that's primarily how they related to God by faith. When you get to the New Testament, suddenly there's a huge shift of gears not doing away with faith or God, but in how people relate in this new agreement to God. And now it's principally through the resurrected Jesus. Those leaders from the past kind of fade into the background. The law that was given for the Jewish people to govern them, you know, that kind of fades into the background. And now you relate directly through Jesus and His teachings and the explanations that 
the apostles give about Jesus' teaching, which formulate the rest of the New Testament. So that's what a testament means. It's just an agreement of how we're going to relate with one another. One is through leaders in law in the old. The other is through the leader, Jesus, in life. Okay, look at uh, what it says next. There are 39 Old Testament books. Look there in your table of contents. There are 39 Old Testament books. In the original Hebrew Bible, there are 39 books, except some of those books are combined together. So if you were to look at a Hebrew Bible, there would only be 24 books. But they're the same books. Like in our Bible, it would say First and Second Samuel, two books. In the Hebrew Bible, it just says Samuel. But both books are included in that one. So they have less books, but they're the same literature in both. But there are 39 books. They're written between 1500 and 400 B.C. Moses was the author of Genesis, the first book, in 1500 B.C. Malachi was the author of the last book of the Old Testament in 400 B.C. So there are 39 books. There are also 27 New Testament books. Whereas the Old Testament books were written in Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic, the New Testament books were written in Greek. And um, in a lot of the seminaries pastors go to, one of the first series of classes they have to take is they have to take the languages, Greek and Hebrew. I just got back from a tour of uh, New England, and um, it was funny, in, in the early days of our country, when uh, the Puritans form, formulated the great universities of Yale, Harvard, and Princeton. Now, they were very elementary in those days. But for a person to be admitted to Harvard and Yale in those days, they had to be able to read Hebrew and Greek. And the reason is, is because the, the, the curriculum that they studied in the universities in the early days of our country were not about a major, it was about character. And in order to have character, they had to be able to read the Bible in the original languages. That's where your forefathers were. That's amazing, isn't it? But the New Testament was written in Greek, the Old Testament in Hebrew. Look at number three, the third kind of principle. The big picture of the Bible can be best understood by five Jesus-centered divisions. The first is probably the biggest division. It's what we call the anticipation of Jesus. And it really involves the whole Old Testament. Because you can look up here on the screen and you see the anticipation of Jesus is between Genesis and Malachi, which in your table of contents is the whole Old Testament. Now, why do we say that? We say that because all the way through the Old Testament, there are hints, whispers, shouts to us that, that there is someone greater coming in the future. Now, the Jewish people were following, remember, leaders in law, but mixed in all that leaders in law were all kinds of hints that something greater was coming. And that was pictured in... In, in stories that were told in the Old Testament. For instance, if you saw the movie, The Ten Commandments, do you remember in Ten Commandments that Moses is leading the people out of bondage in Egypt and he's, he's issuing all these plagues to the Egyptians to be released? And one of the plagues is the death angel that would pass over Egypt and kill all the firstborn sons of every household unless they went and got the blood of a lamb and put it over the doorpost of their home. And if they did that, the death angel would pass over that house, that's why it's called Passover, and spare the firstborn. Well, thousands of years later, when Jesus comes on the scene, he references, as did the early church, that Passover was simply a picture of the coming Jesus, who, when he died, he called himself the Lamb of God. And if my blood, not over your house, on your doorpost, but if my blood is over your life, then death would pass over you and you would be given eternal life. See how that's a picture of what's to come? And then the people who lived in the Old Testament, many of the people in the Old Testament were simply forerunners of a greater picture of Jesus. For instance, David was the king of Israel. He was one of the great kings or the greatest king of Israel. And David comes on the scene, and, and uh, David is a finite king leading his country with integrity and a, a deep relationship with, with God. But David was just a forerunner to the coming king, 
the eternal king, Jesus, who was from the house of David. So there was a picture there as well. Jonah and the whale, or Jonah and the great fish. You know, Jonah, that's a story of being swallowed up and then burped up on the land after he was in three days in the belly of the, the fish. And that's a great story about him. You'll have to read it if you hadn't read it before. But later when Jesus, this is hundreds of years later, when Jesus is with his disciples and teaching in the people, teaching the people, he said to those people, Jonah was just a picture of me. And then here's how he related. He said, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights and then come alive again. Jonah came out on the shore. He was resurrected, so to speak, after being swallowed. And Jesus said, that was just a crude picture of my death and resurrection. And he said the whole Old Testament was like that. And as he battled a little bit against the religious leaders of that day who had gotten so consumed in the law and just obeying the law, thinking that was going to earn their way to heaven, Jesus said to them these words, and they're in your outline in John 5.39. These are Jesus' words. He says this, You search the Scriptures. Now look up there. The only Scriptures that existed in that day was the Old Testament. So he said, Jesus said, you search the Old Testament because you think in them you have eternal life. But then he says, it is these that testify about me. If you were to really look at them the way you should, they speak of me. And, and one thing I didn't mention was in the Old Testament, all the great prophecies that are just kind of peppered through the Old Testament that keep pointing to someone greater who's coming. So this Christmas, when Christmas comes around, you'll hear at some moment during the Christmas season, somebody will quote Isaiah 7.14 that was written 700 years before Jesus. And yet, in the midst of this diatribe that Isaiah is giving against uh, a king there in Israel, he suddenly pops forth and says these words, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. And I'm sure if you were back in that day and age, you go, what's he talking about? A virgin's going to be with child and he's going to be God with us? Who's that? Well, 700 years later, a virgin gives birth to a child and names him Emmanuel, who becomes Jesus Christ. You see how that works? The Old Testament anticipates the coming of Jesus. Okay, what about Matthew through John? That's the manifestation of Jesus. The Gospels are kind of a stereo system over the life of Jesus, quadraphonic stereo that gives the story or the life of Jesus from four different perspectives, and we'll talk about that next week. But you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four speakers, all historically recording the life of Jesus from four different perspectives, so you have surround sound. See that? That's why you have four Gospels, not just one. Then there is the explanation of Jesus. Well, if you look in your table of contents, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the proclamation of Jesus, which is Acts, and that is after Jesus was resurrected, you have the story of the early church, how they took that message of the resurrected Christ and spread it around the world, which then leads into, as they spread it around the world, the explanation of Jesus, which I jumped prematurely to, which is in Romans through Jude. And if you look at your outline there in the New Testament, that takes you almost to the end of the New Testament. But that is the writers, the people who follow Jesus, knew him, his apostles. They're giving further explanation to early Christians about Jesus' life and what he meant by what he said. It's kind of a commentary on Jesus' life. Which then brings us to the consummation of Jesus, which is the last book of the Bible in Revelation. And basically what Revelation is telling us is how history will end. In other words, planet Earth is not going to go, along, go on forever. Now we know that physically because the sun will ultimately burn out. But long before the sun burns out, the sun will bring this world to an end according to the book of Revelation. And the Apostle John tells you how that's going to happen. So that's kind of a big picture of the whole Bible. 
concerning Jesus. Now what we're going to do is we're going to turn just specifically to the Old Testament. And so now you can kind of mark off the side of the New Testament table of contents, and now we're just going to go down through the Old Testament side of the page. Okay? And this is where I want you to use your pen, if you don't mind marking in your Bible. Because here's how the Old Testament is broken down. It's broken down first with 17 historical books. So look there, and you'll see Genesis to Esther. And if you want to, guys, look up at me for a minute. You might just take brackets and start with Genesis and go down and then bracket off where Esther finishes. Those are the historical books of the Old Testament. Now, what do the historical books do? They tell you a factual story of the history of Israel. So if I wanted to tell you about the Jewish people and what happened to them and those kind of things, we would drop the rest of the Old Testament and all we'd do is start in Genesis and we'd read it through and at Esther we'd go the end and shut it. Those are the facts. Okay? Now, of course, there are other books. There are five poetical books and those are the books and you could bracket those off. They start with Job and they end with the Song of Solomon. You see them there? Job to Solomon. Those are the books, because that's why they call them poetical books, those are the books that have a lot of feeling in them. They're, they're very personal. You open up the Psalms and the psalmist is pouring out his heart to God or you read the, the, the uh, Song of Solomon and he's pouring out love to a potential bride. Or you look at Ecclesiastes and it's a philosophical book of what is the meaning of life, but it's all stuff from the heart. So where you can put facts around the historical books, you can put feeling with exclamation points around these poetical books. And that's why every time you open your Bible and you go into one of these books, all of a sudden it seems very personal. Whereas if you go to one of the historical books, it feels like you're in, you're in an action movie. And then, of course, then the last books are the prophetical books that start with Isaiah. And you can put brackets around them to Malachi. To Malachi. And those books, <laughs> those books are filled with fire and fury. And then some about the future. That's where you get these prophecies. But a lot of the, po the prophetical books are not just, a, not just talking about the future. They're real-time prophets who are speaking to the people of Israel or against the people of Israel about key moral issues. And that's why when you read them, sometimes they feel real angry. <laughs> You're going, what's this guy's problem? Well, if you knew the historical context, going back and reading the history, it would make sense why they're speaking these denunciations or uh, telling the people to step it up, shape up, you know, or they're going to be shipped out, and eventually they were shipped out. We'll talk about that in a moment. But that's why you have those prophetical books there. Okay, principle five. The historical books offer the overall storyline, write that in, the overall storyline of the Old Testament beginning with creation and ending at 400 B.C. Okay, so the Old Testament starts with the creation of the world whenever that was and ends promptly at 400 B.C. That's the end of the Old Testament. That's as far as it goes. The remaining poetical and prophetical books that I just talked to you about, and everybody look up at here for just a moment. Those books, the prophetical and the poetical books, those books are hanging out here. Here's the history. It ends at 400 B.C. We take those books and we go and we fit them into the storyline because they were written during the history. Okay? So you need to know, for instance, with Psalms, Psalm just isn't hanging out there. Psalms was written during the time of the United Kingdom with David and Solomon. And so when you're reading a psalm, really you're reading a psalm in the time of 1 and 2 Samuel. Does that make sense to you? So you have to fit. Or when Isaiah is prophesying, you've got to take Isaiah and move him over to the divided kingdom and say the reason he was angry or the reason he was speaking of the future is because of a historical circumstance here during the time of the divided kingdom. So all these books fit into the overall storyline of the historical books. So we'll look at those for just a minute. Let's look at the, the uh, storyline of the uh, 17 Old Testament books. Let me just walk you through the story of the Old Testament 
in the historical books real quickly, okay? And then it'll be important for you to go back and, and look at this. We're going to put a map up here, but, and I can kind of show you how it plays out in history here. By the way, this is Iraq, our modern-day Iraq. In biblical times, it was called Babylon, okay? And then here's Egypt, and then here's Israel. And really, the Old Testament storyline is between these three countries. And I'll show you how that works here in just a moment. But the Old Testament begins, like in your notes, it begins with the creation of the world and key events of early man. It starts with the first man, Adam, okay, in Genesis 1, and it ends, that, that first part, in Genesis 11, with the first man of the nation of Israel, Abraham, who's real important, okay? So you go Adam to Abraham. Now we know when Abraham lived, because Abraham the Bible tells us, lived in Iraq. He lived down in a southern city called Ur. Okay? And God calls him out of Ur and calls him to leave Ur and go and live in Israel or the promised land. This is the promised land right here. And so starting in chapter 12 of Genesis, you have the story of Abraham moving from Babylon or Iraq and going to Israel. Now, that's important to know because when he gets there in chapter 12, you move from early man and the things that happened there, you know, with Adam and going all the way to Abraham, to you move into another season that we call the time of the patriarchs. And the time of the patriarchs is when Adam, I mean, when Abraham settled down in the promised land and he bore children and they bore children and they began to multiply and spread out into 12 tribes during that time. And you get to experience that from Genesis 12 after early man to the nation of Israel through Genesis chapter 50. So that's where that time period ends. So now here they are. They, they have filled out part of the land with their families in these loosely associated tribes who are all coming from the loins of the sons of Abraham. And they're there and a famine hits. And when the famine hits, the people of Israel are forced to move down into Egypt. And they go down into Egypt, and for a while, they're welcome there, and they settle into the land there. But then as the governments change in Egypt, a Pharaoh raises up is that he's feeling threatened by the people of Israel. So rather than them being welcomed, he makes them slaves. And that moves us from the first book, Genesis, to the second book, Exodus. Because while they're slaves and oppressed down there, and they were for quite a while, God raises up a deliverer, Moses, who then does these supernatural plagues that causes the Pharaoh to finally release the people who are in Egypt, the, the Israelis, to go back to Israel. So then they move, they go from Iraq, the promised land, back to Egypt, then back to the promised land. And that takes us through the book of not just Exodus, but along the way, some other books are written. They're listed there in your outline, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Because as they're going through the wilderness back to the promised land, God uses Moses to kind of bring the people together. God gives him a law and the Ten Commandments, another law to have them morally cohesive. And then they're ready to go back into the promised land. But Moses dies. And so God raises up a second leader. His name is Joshua. And in your table of contents, that's the book of Joshua. And what Joshua does is he leads the people from the wilderness into the promised land to conquer it. And that historical circumstance is described in the book of Joshua. So the people go back into the land. They settle back down. Uh, they begin to prosper. But they're still loosely associated tribes. And as you might imagine, some of those tribes go different moral directions than others. And so they need, again, somebody to pull them together. So God raises up judges. Okay, These judges are kind of uh, uh, appointed leader, moral leaders that help people kind of get their bearings again about why they are the way they are and how to kind of righten their steps in following God. So these judges kind of carry them through a period of time, but the nation continues to grow. And just like in many social circumstances, when 
people keep growing and getting bigger and having different uh, opinions and ideologies, you need to centralize them so the people realize things aren't going as well, so they start crying out for a king. So God grants them that request, and you move from this loosely associated group of tribes to finally a nation with a king. And the first king is Saul. And you've got it there in your outline. You've got the uh, Jewish kings of the United Kingdom. They become one kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and they have three great kings. They have Saul, they have David, and they have Solomon. And if you look at your table of contents, those are the books of First and Second Samuel and First Kings and First Chronicles. That describes all those events historically. So those kingdoms go along fairly well until Solomon. When Solomon dies, this last great king, there becomes some contention, as happens in any kingdom, about who's going to be the next king. And uh, different ones start vying for that. And that creates a split in the nation. So now here they are in the promised land, but the nation is fractured, and it fractures north and south. So the northern part of Israel now becomes known as Israel and the southern part of Israel becomes known as the kingdom of Judah. So now there are two nations, not one. And if you look again in your table of contents, those are the books of first and second Kings and second Samuel, I mean in second Chronicles. And that describes this period of time where you had this divided nation. Now here's what's interesting. Now they're divided. The northern kingdom becomes more and more secular or more and more committed to false gods. The southern kingdom stays a little more true to the God of their fathers, the true God of Israel. So what happens in that is, is that God brings part of this empire that we now know as Iraq. It was known as Assyria at that time. They come in and destroy the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, they completely wipe it out and carry its inhabitants back into captivity. And, and as far as we know historically, they disappear. So now there's only one nation, and that's the nation of Judah. And Judah sits there for a while, sometimes faithful to God, sometimes not faithful to God. But after a period of time, they begin to wander away. So God raises up another nation that's also in this territory of Iraq called Babylon. Now, it's called Babylon because way back in early man, they had the Tower of Babel. And so it's called Babylon. But God raises up Babylon, and the Babylonians come in and destroy the nation of Judah. And they take all the inhabitants of Judah, and they carry them back to Babylon. And they stay in Babylon in captivity for 70 years until a king comes along that decides to grant the people of Israel who are held in captivity the ability to move back from Babylon back to the promised land. Okay, so that's why we have the error going back again. So they come back and they settle in, but now they've got to rebuild their whole nation. I mean, it's been wiped out. It's basically just kind of low-level farming at that point. So they come back, they rebuild the city of Jerusalem with the walls around it, and they begin to rebuild the nation itself for a fairly long period of time. And those are the historical books that you have before you of Ezra and Nehemiah. You can also add Esther. But those are the three books that refer to the return of Israel from Babylon to rebuild the nation. And now the nation is rebuilt. It's, it's on its feet a little bit. And once it's on its feet, as you finish the book of Nehemiah, that's when the Old Testament ends as far as the storyline. Now it's over. So here's what we've done. We started in Iraq. We went to the promised land. We left the promised land and went to Egypt with a famine. Then we had Moses lead us back to the promised land. Joshua helped conquer it. It became a nation divided into two nations. The upper nation was destroyed by Assyrians. The lower nation stayed as a nation until Babylon took it back to Babylon or Iraq. Then through the benevolence of a king allowed them to come back and rebuild their nation. And now they're back in the promised land and the Old Testament ends at 400 B.C. That's the storyline. Okay? Now, what about those poetical and prophetical books? Where do they fit in this? Well, we're going to move through this pretty quickly, but I just want you to see on your outline where they fit, okay? For instance, 
the poetical book of Job. Job, if you read Job, it's a very somber book, but it's about suffering. But Job, as far as uh, what scholars think, because of the, 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 the uh, historical circumstances he mentions in his book, they think he wrote his book during the time of Abraham, okay? which would have been right at the beginning of the nation of Israel. The rest of the poetical books were written during the time of the United Kingdom. Psalms is about worship. Proverbs is about wisdom. Ecclesiastes is philosophical. It's about the meaning of life. The Song of Solomon is about romance and marital love. And those were all written during Israel's greatest times in the past, in the time they were, they were united under one king. The prophetical books are different. They're scattered. They're peppered through the life of Israel. Bef they were all written during the time of the divided kingdom. Okay? These prophetical books. And by the way, a prophet was to Israel what a free press is to a democracy. The, the prophets weren't part of the government. Okay? They stood outside the government. And when they saw things going wrong, they would denounce it or speak against it or maybe even speak for it if it was good things. So the prophets were kind of thorns, like a free press is. You know, the government's trying to hide like David's over there. This is a real circumstance in the Bible. He's over there trying to hide as king of Israel his affair with Bathsheba and his illegitimate, illegitimate pregnancy. <laughs> yeah, that's a real story there. So what does God do? He raises up a prophet speaks against David and goes and confronts David and says, you're not, you're not a leader of integrity. You don't stand for the true God of Israel. You need to repent. See, he was a thorn. And that's what the prophets a lot of times did. They provided corrections as the government moved forward as a freestanding group. And many times they weren't particularly liked by the government. Okay, And so you had prophets like that who were before the exile when it was, there were two kingdoms, Israel and Judah, and those are listed there in your outline during the divided kingdom, those prophets. So when you open up to Obadiah or Joel or Jonah or whatever, you're opening up to the time period where Israel is in the land, but they're two different nations. Then you have books written during the exile. When the southern kingdom was carried to Babylon, those were the prophets who wrote during the time that the people were in captivity in Babylon. Daniel, Ezekiel, and Lamentations. And then when they come back from the exile and they come back into the land, and here's what happened. Remember, it was great that they got back in the land and they've rebuilt their, their city of Jerusalem. They've got their temple. Uh, the nation's beginning to grow. But just like any people, as they begin to grow and have government stuff, they start having problems. And who's going to be the correcting agent to their problems? God raises up prophets after they get back in the land for the final time. And those prophets are listed there in your outline, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And that's why, guys, if you look at your table of contents, the last book in the Old Testament is Malachi. He's the last prophet speaking to the people as they're rebuilding their nation, trying to keep them on course with God so they would be the nation God wanted them to be. And that's 400 B.C. And at that point, guys, the Old Testament ends. All right? Now we're going to add a little bonus now that we've ended the Old Testament and we know where the prophets fit, we know where the, the poetical writers fit, and we know just generally the storyline. And I know I've dumped that storyline on you, but if, if I were you, if you wanted to help yourself and gift yourself, somewhere this week you would just simply take this out and you would just kind of walk it back through in your mind and say, this is why this happened, this is why that happened, here are the books, just to give you some coordinates. Because I'm telling you, if you do that, you'll give yourself a great gift because the Old Testament won't seem scary to you anymore. It'll just seem, it makes sense. I don't know all the contents, but it makes sense to me, and I know where I am. It's kind of like walking into a mall, you know, and you got the big faceplate that says, you know, there's... 1,500 shops in this place and, and then it's got a little arrow that says you are here. That, that's a great feeling for me when I open up the Old Testament and I look at, you know, Obadiah and I know I'm here. 
I'm in the divided kingdom, and he's a prophet, a thorn in the nation of Israel, and he's probably got something to tell them about what they're doing wrong to keep themselves as a nation on course with God that when I read it, I can use because I live in a nation with a government that has all kinds of corruptions and back you know, room dealings and stuff that the news is constantly trying to make us aware of. And it helps me understand why these guys are saying what they're doing because here's what you'll find. They're saying to their nation what our free press is saying to us every day. Same issues, same problems, but they're trying to pull their people you know, 2,000 years ago, back to God. Our press isn't necessarily trying to, to do that. But that's where we get the help because here's what we know with what the Bible teaches. A nation that's righteous, a nation that's moving to righteousness is going to be healthy. A nation that's moving away from righteousness can only expect more problems and more disintegration. And history is littered with those civilizations. And if the U.S., our country is going to stand, part of what gives us strong footing is a strong moral foundation that's built on biblical truth. That's, that's what I think is the message of the Old Testament to us today. Okay, now we're going to finish by looking at what happened, because remember, we started at 1500 B.C. with Abraham, right? We ended with Malachi at 400 B.C. And then from 400 B.C., the next great event in history is suddenly at zero. What happened at zero? <laughs> That's when Jesus was born. And then we have a whole new storyline. So what happened in these 400 years? If you're ever reading a, a historical book or whatever, theologians as well as scholars call those 400 years the 400 silent years. And the reason they call them the 400 silent years, and the Jews call it that because, you know, when Malachi finished, most Jews, they were used to prophets coming along and great leaders. They had been experiencing that for over a thousand years. And then all of a sudden from 400 to zero, no prophet showed up. It just got quiet. And you'd be asking yourself, when's God going to speak to us again? Well, here's what I want you to know was the filler during that time. It's number nine on your outline, the ninth principle. From the time from the end of the Old Testament in 400 B.C. until the birth of Jesus around 1 A.D., it's known as the silent period, a time when no word came from God through prophets and no additional Old Testament books were written or have been written since. But here's something interesting. There were, and you can underline the word were there in your outline, there were additional writings recorded in this silent period that were used by the Jewish people. Okay? And those books, those writings, and don't let this word intimidate you because it's a really simple word, but we're just using it literally. Those writings were called the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha. Now what Apocrypha means? Literally it means, in the dictionary, it just means writings. <laughs> it's just a general word. During that period of time, there were these writings or apocrypha that came into existence during this 400 silent years. And I think they did simply because the Jewish people were saying, does somebody have any extra encouragement out there? I mean, we've been hearing that for a thousand years from prophets. Now there's nothing. Somebody say something. And so people wrote these different letters. And people would read them. Some of them were discarded. Some of them became popular like a best-selling book. And those writings were used in Jewish religious meetings, the best ones, and they, and they encouraged people during that time to stay faithful to God. But here's what I want you to know the Jewish people thought about the writings, and this is the last line. Though those writings were helpful by the, for the Jewish people, the Jews never thought them to be divinely inspired like their Old Testament. They never accepted them as being to be included in the Old Testament. And they were never by, considered by the Jews to be added to the Old Testament. They were just good writings. Okay, let's go through the 400 silent years and now the early church is born around Jesus Christ. Those writings are still out there. And the early church was primarily all Jewish. So when they had their church services, a lot of times they would pick one of those apocryphal writings and read it 
in the church service because it had some encouraging words. And so those writings kind of hung around the church, the best ones, all the way into not just the early church period, but all the way through the next thousand years. And they contained in them some things that you and I would go, that is encouraging. But they also contained certain things that you'd go, does that really fit with what the Old Testament said? Now, if we could display them up here today, there were things that the Apocrypha said that I think would actually contradict what the Old Testament said. But there came a moment in history, and it was during the time of the Reformation, when Protestants under Martin Luther split with the Catholic Church, which was the only church in 1500. There was only one church, the Catholic Church. But in 1500, you had the Protestant Reformation, where a group of people broke away from the Catholic Church and became the Protestant Church, and now we have scads of Protestant churches, okay? But they broke away because they felt that the Catholic Church was not being faithful to the Bible, now the Old and New Testament. And the Catholic Church trying to defend itself around certain doctrines like purgatory, that you don't just die and go to heaven or hell, you die and go to this holding tank, where in this holding tank you can get purged for your sins so that you don't go to hell and now you go to heaven. But that's not taught in the Bible. But it, it's hinted at in some of the apocryphal writings. So in this time where the Catholic Church was trying to defend itself on some of its practices as the Protestant Church moved away from the Catholic Church and said, you're not biblical, the Catholic Church made a momentous decision. It decided and the Pope decided and the Council decided to include certain apocryphal books into the Old Testament. In other words, to make them part of the Old Testament. So look at your, your outline. And let me just read that statement to you because it says it better than I could just ad lib. Here's what it said. In 1546, now, now, now let's, let's stop for a moment. Look at me. 1546. We are 1,500 years away from the close of the New Testament, which finished in 90 AD, and the close of the Old Testament, which finished in 400 BC. This is 1546, and the church is in turmoil because part of the people of the Catholic Church are breaking off into a Protestant protest church. 1546, the church, the Catholic Church meets in a big council. It's called the Council of Trent. And at the Council of Trent, the Catholic Church made the decision to add seven apocryphal books to the Old Testament and several apocryphal chapters to the Old Testament books of Esther and Daniel. When they did that, when they made that decision, they gave these writings, this apocryphal writing, they gave it inspired status and officially recognized them as Holy Scripture. The addition of the Apocrypha today is what makes the Catholic Bible different from the Protestant Bible. And Protestants today, of course, reject the addition of those Apocryphal books. Now, why do I tell you that? Because in this room today, there may be some people who are Catholic, okay? And you can go back and open your Catholic Bible. And if you open your Catholic Bible, you're going to find in your Old Testament 46 books. But if you open a Protestant Bible, you're going to find that Bible has 39 books. What's the difference? The difference is what happened at the Council of Trent in 1546 when the church added these other books and declared them to be divinely inspired. And here's where we stand today. Now turn the page and you have a diagram there in your notes, a colored diagram. We'll, and we'll finish with this, guys, and take a break. But if you turn there... What you're going to see is you're going to see the three Bibles that exist today. You're going to see the Hebrew Bible, you're going to see the Protestant Bible, and you're going to see the Catholic Bible. Now, look up here for just a moment. The Hebrew Bible and the Protestant Bible are exactly the same. Even though the Hebrew Bible says it has 24 books, and the Old Testament Protestant Bible has 39, they're the same books. Some are just put together. So you have 1st and 2nd Samuel just being Samuel, or 1st and 2nd Kings being just kings in the Hebrew Bible. But if you were to separate those like the Protestants have, they would add up to exactly the same, 39 books. But when you come to the Catholic Old Testament, there's 46. 
And what is listed in pink down below, and let's just walk down below and look at them, those are the apocryphal books that have been added in 1546. So, for instance, look under the historical books. In the historical books, you have two additional books added. The book of Tobias. Anybody read Tobias, by the way, lately? <laughs> Nobody has. Okay, that's an apocryphal work. That's a writing. That was a, maybe a bestseller back in 100 B.C. that the Jews used, but they didn't consider it part of the Bible. They just thought of it as a bestseller. But now it's more than a bestseller. It's the Bible. Tobias. And then the book of Judith. Then under the wisdom books, there are no wisdom books in the Protestant Bible, but in the Catholic Bible, there's the wisdom of Solomon, and there's Ecclesiasticus that goes along with Ecclesiastes. Then if you'll look under prophetical books, there's the book of Baruch. And then under the uh, other prophetical books, there's some chapters added to the book of Daniel. Okay? They've added two chapters, chapters 13 and 14, and a few verses uh, to chapter 3. But those are apocryphal. And then down at the bottom, under the um, prophetical books, they've added 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Okay? And if you add those up, you add those up, that's where you get the additional books that the Catholic Bible has that the Protestant Bible doesn't have. Now, the, now just so you don't get confused... The Eastern Orthodox Church, not the Western Catholic Church. The Eastern Orthodox Catholic Church adds even more books, and those are right down at the very bottom. They add 3rd Maccabees, 4th Maccabees, and Psalm 151. <laughs> okay, you put all that together, you have the Eastern Orthodox Bible, Western Catholic Bible, our Bible, and the Hebrew Bible. That's what you see today. Now, I did that so you just wouldn't be confused, because really... For a young Christian starting out and all of a sudden they're talking to a Catholic friend and they see there's other books of the Bible, that, makes, that, I, that just disturbs you. You're saying, what's happening here? You don't understand a context, where they came from, anything. And I'm just trying to help alleviate that by showing you why these Bibles are different. But the big point of this morning was to give you just an overview of the Bible so that when you leave here today you're thinking, you know, the Old Testament breaks down into historical books, poetical books, Prophetical books, there's one storyline, here's where it starts, here's where it ends, here's how that happened where they moved through three countries, and then these books, these poetical and prophetical books, they fit into that, and they are people who are speaking into that history either from a feeling standpoint or from a thorny fire standpoint as prophets. That makes sense to me. Does that make sense to you? That's the Old Testament. That's the Old Testament. So if you will take those nine principles and you'll just kind of massage those into yourself, you're going to give yourself a great gift because what you'll give yourself is a foundation for the Old Testament that you can use and know where you are. And in doing that, that will in time, and for some of you, you're already on this journey, that in time will lead to you as you read the contents, make sense to you, and build a healthy spiritual life because guys this is a bible this is a bible